So thank you everyone today for joining us for the last Population Mental Health Forum of the semester. Um, today, as usual, the forum is going to be recorded. Um, the video will be posted on the school of uh, Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health's YouTube channel and it will be captioned. So that takes a few days. So uh, usually maybe it takes about a week for that to happen. Um, the event will be, this will be a presentation followed by a question and answer session. Please put your questions in the Q&A feature in Zoom and um, we will have them field to our speaker. Um, and we are really delighted today to have Dr. Tanzen Ford with us um, to speak about child um, and adolescent mental health during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. I've been wanting to have um, Tamsin do this for a while and, uh, and we, it's great that we were able to squeeze it in this semester. Um, Dr. Ford is an internationally renowned child psych psychiatric epidemiologist and she researches the organization delivery, delivery and effectiveness of services and intervention for children and young people's mental health. Her work focused on how to promote mental health, prevent mental ill health, and respond effectively to children and young people who are currently struggling. And her work covers, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to have her speak, the full range of psychopathology, agencies, practitioners, and interventions related to the mental health of children. It's really an astonishing breadth and depth of work. She's published over 200 peer review papers in high impact journals and, re, re, and received numerous awards, um, um, including a CBE for services to psychiatry, Student Skill Best Postgraduate Research Supervisor, and um, the Margaret Davenport Prize of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So welcome, um, Tanzen, and thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. Let me just get my slides up. Brilliant. Okay, um, thank you very, very much um, for inviting me to speak and I'm really looking forward to um, discussing some of the research I'm going to um, present to you. I will try to make this as relevant to people from all over the world, um, but bear with me because quite a lot of the work I'm presenting does come from the UK. Um, that's partly because none of it's been published in academic journals yet. And I think it's some of the strongest evidence that we have, by, but not um, all of it. So I think I'm gonna talk a bit about um, this, series of mental health surveys that have happened in the UK. So they were funded by the um, English Department of Health. So um, the United Kingdom is made up of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And England, Wales and Scotland is Great Britain. And those three um, countries got together back in 1999 to commission a survey. And the question the government wanted to know was how many young people out there, children and young people, need mental health services. Now, that was the beginning of my research career. I went off as a fairly experienced trainee. I just got my piece of paper saying I could be a consultant um, child and adolescent psychiatrist. And I went off to be a clinical rater on this first study. And that will make a bit more sense a bit further on. This was supposed to be a five year rolling program. So there was a different new survey in 2004. And then there's a big gap. Well, if you think about five years on from 2004, it's 2009, the government was in a financial crisis as a result of the collapse of the banks and um, our public health statistics, particularly related to children and mothers in deprived circumstances were not looking good. I think, to be honest, they couldn't afford it and they didn't want the answers. So um, a lot of lobbying happened to get this follow-up survey in, in 2017. So these are three separate samples, very carefully selected to be representative of the population of um, Great Britain for the first two and just England for the um, last one. Ten and a half thousand in the first um, survey, nearly 8,000 in the 2004 survey and 9,000 in the 2017. And these were single phase um, studies so that every child had a full multi-informant standardised diagnostic survey. So lots to be um, proud of here. 
And in terms of the health of the UK's children, and I think this goes for most higher income countries, physical health um, is, is doing quite well. So we have a reduction. Um, I think you can see my mouse. We have a reduction. It's not marked, but it's statistically significant. And I think in terms of the number of children, the population attributable fraction, it's a big chunk of the population are less likely to have um, physical health problems. And similarly, the proportion of the population who's completely healthy is going up. But this is not what we're seeing with mental health conditions we are seeing an increase, and this is before we hit the pandemic. And in fact, the um, surveys that I've, I've spoken about were designed to be a series so that we could monitor prevalence. So many of the same team, the same measures, you know, as much delivered in the same way as we possibly could. And there was a small, but statistically significant increase in prevalence between 1999 and 2017. It certainly wasn't the tsunami um, that the media were saying we were seeing, but it was a small um, increase, was almost entirely explained by an increase in emotional disorders or anxiety and depression. Then the pandemic hit. Um, and of course, people were really worried right from the outset about the impact of mental health. And there was an explosion of studies. I have twin daughters who um, were 18 at the time the um, pandemic started, and they you know, were just reporting being emailed or picking up on social media questionnaire after questionnaire, which they'd often have fairly scathing um, views about. And we have a real problem with signal to noise ratio. So I'd like to point you towards this heroic living systematic review being conducted by colleagues from um, McGill University. And they're slowing down, but they are still doing it. So I checked the website last night and they've now screened 90,000, more than 90,000 abstracts and titles for these three systematic reviews. So the first one was changes in mental health. So they want to see changes in symptoms, either the proportion of participants above a cut point or the proportion who changed by a predefined magnitude of you know, a minimally clinically um, important difference across a delineated COVID related event. So either pre post, or different lockdowns, and they excluded studies that only had 100 participants. So that's not such a high bar. The second review was factors associated with change, but actually they stopped that within six months because they realized they wouldn't be able to keep up with all three, and the quality was just really poor. And then intervention studies. Now look at the data, 90,000 plus abstracts and titles screened, 170 studies met that rather low bar for inclusion, and only 11 of those relate to children and young people. So not only have we got the most massive signal to noise ratio and rubbish in, rubbish out, but we also have a real data gap. So the, the studies um, on adults suggest that either there wasn't a huge increase or there was a small increase, particularly in anxiety, but it had dissipated as time went on. The 11 studies involving children and young people include two that in, um, have young people over the age of 18, although most of the sample is um, below. And two additional studies, one of, one of parents of children who were under 13 and one um, of children with intellectual disability. They were all done in high income countries. So the USA, um, UK, Europe, Australia, and then a couple from China. And findings are mixed with some showing no change, but they only looked at emotional disorders because that's what they were doing in adults. So they didn't look at behavior and they didn't look at children with neurodevelopmental conditions. 
Um, one showing an increase in depression and one showing no change, two showing no change in anxiety and another showing no change in loneliness, whereas the studies of parents, sorry, you can tell I'm on a hospital campus here, there's an ambulance just going by. Um, so two UK-based studies of parents, for the, there was no change for those with intellectual disability in their offspring. But the um, study of parents of under 13 showed that parents' mental health deteriorated. Now, we are also doing a systematic review because by their own admission, the McGill team were more focused on adults at the beginning and they are only looking at emotional disorders. And, and I think there's a real issue about um, behavior, peer relationships and pro-social skills. So I can't give you any results of our um, meta-analysis and systematic review of this issue um, is being prepared for the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry and will be um, submitted shortly. But I can give you sort of a heads up. So we screened 5,000 studies and we found 180 that um, we full text um, we full text screened and that gave us 51 studies. We found no evidence for um, a change in anxiety. Any way we looked, we found some evidence for a small increase in depression, but a real lack of data on children as opposed to adolescents. Um, interestingly, for internalizing symptoms in general, so you know, mixed anxiety and depression, we did find evidence if you looked at child's child report, but not by parent report. Um, and there was more, it, there's a hint that there's more likely to have been a change in younger children. In studies of externalizing disorders, fewer studies altogether, mixed quality and also mixed findings, but a hint that boys and younger children were more likely to deteriorate. No studies on under 10s and possibly opposing effects um, in terms of pro-social behavior and peer relationships. So children who were doing really well pre-pandemic experienced a drop in pro-social skills and peer relationships, whereas those who were struggling prior experienced better peer relationships and more pro-social behavior, which is really intriguing. So watch this space that's literally hot off the press and not fully digested yet. So as what the, coming back to the signal and noise um, problem, there was a real issue of we didn't know. There were massive changes, a sort of huge collective trauma. And there is an issue with time versus quality. So we happen to be in discussion with the Department of Health about accessing the 2017 sample with some funding we got. We've been speaking to them already for six months when the pandemic hit, and it just made perfect sense to pivot what we were doing into thinking about COVID rather than just the question we had. It still took four or five months to get all the permissions and get the follow-up underway. And the data from that first follow-up in 2020 is still not released for academics to use. So, I can totally see that well-constructed convenient samples can tell you something and they can get into the field very quickly. But there are some myths, which I think behoves us as, as epidemiologists and public health experts to dispel. And that is large is not inevitably better. You know, the, there was a study that came out of, of China that had 52,000 people in it. But in a country that's known for its male gender skew, 65% of the sample were women. So probably it tells you a lot about women's mental health, but not a lot about men's mental health. You can wait back, but that will only partially address bias and sometimes actually can kind of cement it in. And all our um, statistical assumptions are based on having a probability sample. And if you don't have one, that theoretically at least is, is a problem. Ideally, what we want is you know, quick and dirty initially and then better methodology as time goes by. So I'm gonna give you a sprinkling of some of the intriguing findings that we've been thinking about over the last couple of years. 
This is from a report from the School of Public Health, which is across England and, and Wales in um, the UK. Um, and it's a, a network of universities focusing on building capacity and skills in public health. This actually was somebody's PhD. So they had been in schools in October 2019, getting mental health data from um, year nine. So that's young people aged between 13 and 14 on the, on the 31st of August. And when the pandemic happened, they had the nous to swing back, um, which wasn't intended, and they've collected a series of um, surveys. Now they're not individually linked because it was only ever supposed to be cross-sectional data, but they do have a variable where they ask people, have you participated in, in previous waves? And if so, which one? So we can do repeated cross-sectional surveys on them. And overall, they found no difference um, in April 2020. So this was the peak of the first very complete lockdown in the UK. Overall, there was no difference on their mental health measures between the two times in, in the whole population. But when you split it by mental health pre-pandemic, so those who were struggling, and this is for the, um, the these are depression symptoms, the Hamilton um, depression scale, you, you can see that those who were struggling um, are doing better. So their depression symptoms have reduced. I can show you the same for um, anxiety and also for the um, Warwick Edinburgh measure of well-being, which is really interesting. We have to think about what it might be for these young people that the pandemic relieved. And the graph I've put up in front of you now is from um, the UK longitudinal. Um, survey, also sometimes known as Understanding Society. So this is um, a sort of accelerated cohort design. So people have been completing up to six waves of data and they keep bringing more people in at the age of um, 16. Um, so obviously there's less data available on, on 16 plus and some people have been in the data for in the study for about 15 years. And Data was collected monthly during 2020, and the initial data suggested um, that young people, so emerging adults, 16 to 24 in particular, were doing particularly badly. It won't surprise anybody that those living in socioeconomic deprivation, particularly those who were newly experiencing it, were doing badly as were the parents of young children. Now, for those of us who work with children, that's important because parental mental ill health is a strong predictor for child mental ill health. And then when you look over time, you see these distinct trajectories. So the general health questionnaire is the outcome they were studying. And this is a brief epidemiological measure of, of what some psychiatrists would call common mental disorder. So anxiety and depression symptoms. And a high score is bad. So you have, going from the bottom to the top of the picture, you have two excellent, you know, two good and very, you know, a good and a very good trajectory. You have one group who deteriorated sharply and then pretty much responded back to where they were. And then you have two groups that either deteriorated sharply and pretty much stayed where they were, or they slowly and steadily deteriorated over time. And it won't surprise you that younger people, people from ethnic minorities, people facing food, housing, or financial insecurity were all more likely to be amongst those who did badly, as were people with um, prior mental health conditions. There have been some interesting studies, and this is, I think, is the best of them, although it is a convenient sample, um, on lockdown restrictions. So the graph you're looking at here comes from CoSpace, which was run by Cathy Cresswell out of Oxford, and she recruited a large sample and got repeated measures from parents of 
their children um, under the age of 16 and from 11 year olds, their own self reports. And she's plotted, the, the measure was the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which has a scale on attention, hyperactivity type symptoms, emotional symptoms, and another one on behavior. And what you can see is there is there are these distinct fluctuations depending on um, the, the level of lockdown that these children were living in, which is interesting. And other studies have suggested something similar. Now, Cathy's was a convenient sample. They worked extremely hard to try and make sure that they had representation from those living in um, socioeconomic deprivation from ethnic minorities, but they were dreadfully underrepresented. But in this sample, those underserved groups were doing consistently badly, as were the children who had special educational needs. Now, another Oxford run um, survey um, by Karen Mansfield, who is the person on, on the left, um, and now analysed in more depth by Emma Somerson, who's actually a PhD student in, in um, Cambridge um, and a Gates scholar. She comes from the USA, somebody to watch if she comes home. Um, is this interesting finding that although quite a chunk of young people, and this is a large sample, um, sample from school, so we have a sample frame, um, across a broad part of, of the UK. Um, whilst some people, and particularly um, the older young people, felt that they felt much less happy during lockdown, there is this chunk of people who said they were doing much better. And that's really interesting. And I'm going to pick that up a bit later. <laughs> so if we now come to the national survey and the follow-ups that I've been talking about. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, I misread my title. It says you're um, screen sharing. Um, the this, this sharing screen is over the title. Sorry, I'm still on the Oxwell survey. They also asked in that they do this survey every year um, because the schools were back open and the surveys are completed in school and the schools are open. They got a bigger sample this time and more schools have come on board. Um, so they asked these young people from the age of nine upwards, would you take a COVID vaccine if you were offered it? Now, at this point in the UK, young people under the age of 18 were not being offered a vaccine. And what's really interesting is that whilst half were willing, only 13% were anti-vaccination or said they were really unwilling. So the biggest chunk of those who could be described as vaccine hesitant were not bothered. And what predicted vaccine hesitancy was being younger, better mental health, which is interesting, having already had COVID, so perhaps feeling like, well, I don't need an immunisation, and then the more deprived and um, marginalised groups. Now, I think the implication of this study is that if you want to change vaccine hesitancy in this group, it's about education. It's not that people are anti-vax and you don't need to persuade them about vaccines. It's about, you know, getting alongside people um, and giving them information so that they do know. I should also say that most um, parents in the Understanding Society who put in a similar question, most parents were very willing to have their children vaccinated. And in fact, now in the UK, we're, behind the USA, they're just beginning to think about vaccinating primary school children. So the other um, area of, of um, COVID infection that reflects on um, mental health is long COVID. So I'm very proud to be part of this um, excellent study run from UCL, from Great Ormond Street um, and the Institute of Child Health. So 
we basically have two cohorts, two matched cohorts of children aged between 11 and 17 years who got a formal PCR test, either because they were symptomatic or because they'd been in contact. Um, and we recruited them between the 1st of September and the 31st of March last year. So we recruited the positives first and then matched them by age, sex and geography to people who had been to the same test center and become negative. They were all people who were not in hospital. And we've then contacted them three, six and 12 months um, where we've got the last follow ups to do. And then we're going to try and link to national data sets so we can follow them longer. Now, at the time we started this, there wasn't really a consensus definition of what long COVID is. Um, and it was one of the things that we, this study wanted to set out. I'm not sure we're actually there yet. Now, it won't surprise anybody that there were more people who had symptoms at the time they went to the test amongst those who tested positive, because I suspect there were more people who, among the negatives, who've just been told, go along, you've been in contact with someone. There wasn't a lot of difference um, between the types of symptoms, although at this time it may have changed. Unusual fatigue and loss of smell and taste was seemed to be um, distinguishing those who tested positive from those who tested negative. Um, and at follow-up, it's, it's even more similar. There wasn't really a difference in the types of problems that people reported. Um, and in fact, there wasn't a statistically significant difference in the number of people who had one symptom still going on at three months. By the time you get to three symptoms or five symptoms, it's about double. So 30% of those who tested positive had three or more symptoms and 13% of those who um, tested positive had five or more symptoms, um, but about half as much amongst the test negatives. And I think another really important finding to come out of um, the three month data was that there was no difference on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire or the Warwick Edinburgh wellbeing measure in mental health between the groups who had persistent symptoms, whether they tested negative or positive. So at least at, you know, at this point, there wasn't any difference. But amongst both the test positives and test negatives, there were these groups of people, there were more of them amongst the test positives, but they were equally there amongst the test negatives who had multiple symptoms and were really struggling. Now, these young people who were struggling were more likely in both groups to be girls rather than boys, to be older, you know, older teens rather than um, early adolescents, and to have had poorer baseline physical and mental health. And they were quite disabled as a group. So that's as far as we can go with the clock study, but watch this space. The six months data is being cleaned and analyzed and the 12 months data is being cleaned. There will be much more to come from this study, which I think is you know, one of the better ones I've seen in this area. So moving back to the national surveys now. Um, so we, followed up as many as we could, but there'd been no keeping in touch exercise. So actually our response rates are just below 50%, which on one way is um, disappointing, but on the other hand, for a population sample that's not been contacted for over three years and in, is in the middle of a pandemic, that's perhaps not bad. So the children were aged two to 19 in 2017. So when we first went back, they were five to 23. And in fact, there is a questionnaire in the field at the moment, um, and the children are now seven to 24. Whereas at baseline, parents um, and young people aged 11 or over had a face-to-face -face interview. And if the family agreed, uh, a shorter questionnaire was mailed to the parents. 
and there was this standardized diagnostic assessment, the DORBA. We obviously didn't have the resources to do that across the country. We couldn't in 2020 have gone and seen people face to face. So it was online brief questionnaire. Um, and the aims were to see what was going on with mental health, to describe how families were experiencing COVID and then a focus on um, how ethnic minority groups were doing as far as we could. So the strengths and difficulties questionnaire um, is very widely used and actually is um, contributes to part of the DORBA. Um, so we had that in 2017 and that was our measure in these follow up surveys. And there is an algorithm that will combine data from parents, teachers, and young people, if you have all three of them, but it will run on just one informant that will give you a category of probable, possible, or unlikely disorder. Um, so obviously for the 11 to 16 year olds, we often have both parent and young person, um, and that is more reliable than the young person alone. Um, parents and teachers are probably about as accurate as each other. And the bottom line is at population level, we are seeing a deterioration from 2017, from one in nine who had probable disorder to one in six. And that was maintained last year. And, you know, by the summer, we should know what's happening this year. The um, prevalence um, was you know, it, it reflects patterns that we've seen before with a, a preponderance of boys who are struggling in primary school years, evening up, up in the secondary school years, and then young women in, in the UK population seem to be really struggling. We're getting signals from many different surveys that those in their later teens and early 20s are experiencing really high rates of anxiety, depression and self-harm even before the pandemic hit. There has been a deterioration in, in all groups. Um, and again, young women seem to be doing particularly badly and had a particularly sharp deterioration initially. But the deterioration is there in both genders and all age groups. And then in ethnic minorities, um, unusually, we hadn't seen this, but the group that, that was doing the worst in 2017 were young people who were white. The, those of mixed ethnicity were not far behind them. Um, and then because this is a probability sample, it's reflective of the population and we don't actually have significant numbers to be able to split down very much by the time we, we get to the follow-ups. But the implication was there was a sharp, sudden deterioration that's maintained amongst the white population, whereas ethnic minorities are experiencing a more steady deterioration. And there are ethnic differences in this. So, um, if you have a look at the dark blue bars, you'll see um, the white population and the mixed population are much more likely to be able to work from home, which means it's easier to um, cope with lockdowns. Um, whereas those of um, black British um, populations um, and to a lesser extent, the Asian populations are falling behind financially and experiencing financial hardship. And that maybe that um, underpins the slow, steady change. This, this is all descriptive data because we haven't managed to extract it from NHS Digital yet to analyze in a more detailed way. Then um, if we have a look at sleep problems, just going to check that. Yes. So um, just over a quarter of the whole population reported having sleep disruption, which of course can be because of poor mental health, but it's also a risk factor for poor mental health. Um, 
and it was more common amongst those with a probable disorder at every age. So th this was a question about sleep in the last seven days. And um, it does reflect many other surveys. Likewise, loneliness is another um, mental health risk factor. And it won't surprise anybody that those who um, were more likely to have a probable disorder were also more likely to report feeling lonely, but it's very worrying that one in 10 um, children and young people reported in 2020 that they always or often felt lonely, and that was the same in 2021. And again, you know, there's such a strong link that we know about um, in relation to financial deprivation, it won't surprise anybody that food insecurity was um, more likely, people experiencing food insecurity were more likely to either report their children or the young people, if they were old enough to um, report their own data, were more likely to have a probable disorder. This also emerged from Oxwell and from CoSpace and from many, many other studies. So these are all known risk factors and I think the my take from the data is that actually the risk factors aren't new or different, but the pandemic is highlighting them and concentrating them in some parts of our population. So these questions were asked in both 2020 and 2021 about um, access to um, education while schools were shut. And the two things to take away is that in a country as, as rich as the UK, we couldn't manage to ensure that every child had access to a device or the internet in order to be able to access school remotely. And that that was more common amongst um, young people with who had a probable disorder and that, you know, a sizable chunk of the population didn't have any of these things. You may be aware, but across the world, both um, higher and lower income countries, although the data is more solid and um, more frequently reported from higher income countries, that there have been an increased presentation of people with eating disorders to services, both adults and children. And this is worrying because um, and eating disorders carry a mortality. Um, and they tend to be persistent. So we obviously couldn't do the same diagnostic measure as we'd done in 2020, but each type of disorder that the DORBA, the Development and Wellbeing Assessment um, covers has screening questions. So what we did was we took these screening questions into the, the survey that parents reported last year to see whether there had been a change. And I, I, you know, to put it in context, NHS England is reporting a doubling of urgent and emergency referrals. Um, so literally double the number that they'd seen the previous year in parallel with an increase in routine referrals as well. But it's quite important to know, is that people coming for help more or is it actually in the population? So what we showed um, was at the time of answering the survey um, that there was quite an increase across all age groups and both genders, but, but particularly marked in the older teenagers amongst those screening positive for eating difficulties. Now that's not the same as having a disorder. And of course we were then charged with, well, what does this mean? now? I have a study that's been very delayed by access to the sample and data governments um, where all those who screen positive are going to be invited to complete the rest of the module. Now it should have happened this time last year. In fact, we are, as we speak, inviting people. So we'll have to rescreen them again. But in the absence of being able to complete the assessments as we planned, we've gone back to 2017 and we've um, done our best to um, 
see how the diagnostic ac accuracy of the screen functions. The problem we have is that the screen negatives didn't do the module. So we don't know what our proportion of false negatives are. So we've applied what was found in preparatory work, which was much smaller, where we found a, a 2.4% of false, um, false negatives. Um, and we've also, um, when we fiddled with the cut point um, to make the parents the same as, as children, we've assumed that it's what we observe, because as soon as you raise the cut point for children to two um, questions, you start seeing um, cases where they um, would have been a screen positive with a cut point at one. And the bottom line is um, that the cut point is cleverly designed to minimize false negatives and to maximize false positives because there is this additional um, situation. So we will do some other work about could this be a really good general screener? Because we have a problem. Most of the screens either ignore younger adolescents and children, or they are lengthy, or they focus on a particular behavior and not eating problems in general. And the bottom line is that you need to speak to parents, even for young adults, for emerging adults, to rule out an eating disorder because of the tendency to conceal symptoms. But you need the young person's account to rule in. If they admit a problem, then there almost certainly is one. So I touched on the work that I'm doing with Tamsin New Love Delgado and Johnny Downs, pictured on this, funded by the UKRI. So from the 2020 follow up, we have finished semi structured interviews with people about their lockdown experience. So we sampled across the range purposively from those who said lockdown made their life better and those who said they made their life worse to try and unpick what was going on there. We've also um, done some questions about education experience to try and learn how we could have done things better. You know, schools were open for vulnerable pupils, but the take up was very, very low. Then in the second wave, we, we are doing the eating disorders and we're also picking out um, young people with um, young, young people with special educational needs. Again, sampling purposively across the range of those who felt that they had adequate or even increased support and those who felt unsupported. Um, we likewise from 2021 had a group experience mon uh, monitoring over four weeks, their mood and stressful experiences, which um, Johnny will be analyzing. So watch this space, a lot to come out. So just to finish up, why is all of this important? You know, why bother? Our meta-analysis and the McGill analysis suggest that an overall population level that actually this is not such a big deal. At a population level, a few people may be struggling a bit, but the sense is that they've, you know, adjusting for other factors and over time at a population level, it's not such a problem. I think from the limited analysis that has been done on the, the MHCYP, so the big British surveys, those who, have moved from not doing, you know, doing fine into the probable disorder range, we're more likely to be sub threshold. So I think this is important because data from the first two surveys, putting all those who had a psychiatric disorder at baseline and then following up three, three years later to see who um, still met diagnostic criteria. 50% of them, and I put persistence in, in quotes because it's two snapshots and we don't know what's going on between, but like Michael Rutter in the, in the um, Isle of Wight study, 50% um, were struggling three years later. These are not transient problems for many young people. The other thing is we also have data that suggests that outcomes for more recent cohorts are worse. So the paper I've put up is by Ruth Sellers um, relating to the um, problems in childhood and, and how um, young people fare in adolescence on a load of different outcomes. And 
there is similar work on the transition between adolescence and adulthood um, from Pravita Pathale. The predictors of persistence in the national surveys are informative too. I think we need to be thinking about children's peer relationships much more than we should do. And again, it's something that's been really disrupted by school closures and lockdowns. And also parental mental health seems to be something that um, predicts persistence, if you will allow me to use the term. So when people say to me, what's happened to child mental health? I think we have a problem with more vulnerable children entering the clinical population, which has seem to expand a bit maybe definitely in certain groups so those where um, the family is struggling financially those with special educational needs or pre-existing mental health conditions and we need to be smart about how we try and reverse that but the majority you know one in six may be struggling in the uk but that means five in six are not so we shouldn't panic and we should think about universal indicated and targeted responses. And I will stop there. I'll make my slides available um, and there's some resources and references. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Tamsin. That was really terrific. Um, Rebecca Lawn, who's our uh, postdoc, is going to be um, handling the Q&A. And I just wanted to point people. So um, Tamsin talked about the cohort changes in uh, mental health. And one of our previous speaker in February, Carrie Keyes, her whole session was on that. So that video is online and she reviewed the literature and the causes. So um, if people are interested, that's, that's one resource they can go to because it's actually um, incredibly interesting. And as Tamsin pointed out, there, we, uh, we had an increase in adolescent mental health problems before, well before COVID um, and it's almost like it's got an attention now. So thank you. Okay, Rebecca, go ahead. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Tanzan. That was so, so interesting. Um, there is a few questions. I've actually got some of my own, but I'm going to start with other people's just to feel a little bit more fair before I hog, um, hog the floor. Um, so one of them, um, the graph, there was a graph, and I can't remember the study now, but it was kind of like a cartoony graph with the um, kind of uh, drawn with, I can't remember what was along the side now, but it ended, it started early in the pandemic in 2020, and it went to winter 2020, no, it went to fall 2020. Oh yes, the coast space study, yes. and the, yeah, the relationship with lockdown, yeah. Yes. Um, and just wondering, um, in the US particularly, fall 2020 um, to winter 2021 was very bad and schools were closed until April 2021. Um, and anecdotal evidence is reporting increases back to school um, in mental health fall in 2021. So kind of what happens, do you think, after that um, graft ended? Well, the um, School for Public Health study in the southwest of England did show a spike of anxiety amongst children in that point. And I think, you know, particularly secondary or high schools are really social spaces. And adolescence is so much about establishing who you are by your relationship with others. And I imagine after long periods of absence from school that actually people have grown and developed at different rates and friendship groups that would have shifted gently over time or perhaps sometimes not so gently, you know, it could be quite abrupt. And I think, you know, the other anecdotal thing that I am hearing is lots of concerns about fights, disagreements, bullying, you know, really quite significant peer relationship difficulties that teachers are just at a loss of how to deal with. In the going back, you mean, when they, when they, yeah, then the, the, you know, the coming back to school when people perhaps have not really had contact with each other. Um, gosh, I wonder what's happened with those ambulances. Um, yeah, you know, the social media might be a bit of a blessing here and might be one of the reasons why older teenagers 
may have had an avenue um, and separately, I didn't present the data, but a colleague, Amy Auburn, has studied having um, access to the internet um, and mental health and demonstrated really quite a strong negative effect of mental health of not being able to access the internet. Um, and I suspect that's not just about not being able to do your lessons. It's, you know, when there is lockdown and you're not allowed out and you're not allowed to see your peers, then social media, at least if you're old enough to use it and you're connected, is, is a way of connecting and carrying on relationships. But it's not the same as interacting with people day in, day out. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if young people are anxious. And of course, there will be, you know, if you're working with somebody who has a social anxiety or some other kind of anxiety disorder that makes it difficult to attend school, half term can be a nightmare, let alone six months out of school. You know, there are going to be a chunk of children who really struggle to get back into school and lesser degrees of anxiety around other children. But then I think, you know, difficulties in peer relationships and bullying and the fact that they're probably much less pro-social because they just haven't had those daily interactions with peers actually might tip, you know, tip um, another people. So I don't think that the schools being open is necessarily the end of the problem. I think it brings in some different problems. Yeah, definitely. And like you said, those different age groups, that's um, interesting in terms of internet. I mean, I can't imagine how you begin to do remote teaching with 34 year olds. I mean, what do you do? Um, yeah. I can see how you might do physics or chemistry or with teenagers. But even then, I imagine it'd be fairly hairy. But, you know, with really tiny, small children, how on earth do you do any anything meaningful online? Yes, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> do not envy, envy them. Um, you mentioned a couple of times, there's another question on the factors that contributed to the increase in mental health problems that were um, observed among youth in the... Oh, no, sorry, that was not actually the question that... Um, Sorry, in terms of the tendency for those with pre-existing mental health conditions to show improvement, I'm stealing this because this was one of mine as well, um, and those without pre-existing mental health conditions to continue to struggle. Do you have any thoughts on why we're seeing this trend, particularly um, interested in that improvement? Um, well, I think what came out of the Oxwell study in terms of free text and sort of more qualitative. So it was, it, they didn't interview them, but there were free text boxes. People talked about escaping from bullying. They talked about repairing or improved relationships at home. That, you know, paradoxically, although I said quite a chunk reported sleep disturbance, and we're certainly seeing food disturbance. And I, I imagine that that's to do with sort of lack of structure um, the loss of st structuring to time for some children and some families. Actually, those who said that things were better often said, I have more time without such a busy schedule and I'm sleeping better and I'm eating better. And I, you know, so I think there was some really interesting work in, in Glasgow, which is multidisciplinary. So um, I heard about it by a colleague who's a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry, Helen Minnis but involved infectious disease modelers, probation, police. And it was thinking about how do we support the most vulnerable families in Scotland? So they interviewed a whole group of them, but also the professionals working with them early on in lockdown. And then again, a few months later, and what they showed in this sort of qualitative study, um, but also with data from domestic violence incidents and presentations to hospital, et cetera, is initially everybody was stressed and anxious. But those who could work from home, had enough devices, had access to the internet, you know, they coped and actually after time began to value having more time together as a family and actually got into a virtuous cycle. Whereas those who were struggling for space or maybe had only one device in the family, so which, which child gets to go to school, um, 
or where there was domestic violence or substance misuse or poor mental health, that they often ended up in, in a vicious cycle of each other's stress and distress and not being able to get away from each other feeding. So I think, you know, we were all in the same storm, but we weren't in the same boat. Um, and, you know, people have described the pandemic as a syndemic in that it's played out differently in different social groups. Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely agree with that. Um, we've got another question here. Um, does do you think long COVID is different from chronic fatigue syndrome? Seems a lot of commonalities and patients have asked this person if progress on long COVID may spur research in understanding chronic fatigue. I think that's a really interesting question. I don't profess to be an expert in either, although I am really interested in that interface between physical and mental health. I think there are a lot of different post-viral sy syndromes that we've known about for a long time that have similarities, but some peculiarities. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think, yes, there are similarities and, you know, we absolutely, are going to have a lot of people who are really badly affected and you know we need to be working harder than we have been at trying to um, find you know there's not very much research in chronic fatigue and particularly in chronic fatigue in children where actually if you're not functioning for a year or two as an adult it's not necessarily disastrous but if you're not functioning at high school for a year or two that can really impact your um trajectories in terms of education, employment, relationships, health, both physical and mental. So yes, I would hope that it stimulates research and particularly in treating and supporting people to function the best they can. Yeah, definitely. When everything is crammed into such a short time that you have to get done, that, it, that is a really good point. Um, and I've got a few more questions and we do have a couple of minutes, um, which it's so hard to, um, uh, in Massachusetts, death rates among younger Latino and black residents are a staggering two to three fold higher than among younger white residents. Um, at the same time, policy preferences of these communities favoring e.g. masking or options for remote school and COVID outbreak settings have been ignored. What do you think the effect of these events is on children's mental health? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and I slightly despair, but also I'm so surprised that the issues around masking became so politicized and so, um, Yes, extraordinarily acrimonious. Um, I am not surprised because of the often the, the intersectionality between deprivation and being from an ethnic minority that death rates are higher. But I'm also not surprised that um, there is less trust of vaccination and less trust of authority figures and when there's a lot of disinformation I think certain populations are much more vulnerable to others for that disinformation and then if you're also in a situation where it's harder to isolate you less chance to work from home um, you're maybe less well nourished in the first place you know you, the, the risks just stack up so I'm not surprised that the death rates are higher and I would hazard a guess that the mental health impacts will also be proportionally worse. Yes, um, thank you for that. Um, I don't know if Kerstin wants to, if we have time for one quick technical question. Um, thanks for a great talk. Can I ask a question I've wondered about in relation to the national surveys in 2017, were the SDQs completed as questionnaires in the same way as they were in 2020 onwards? rather than as interviews with the DORBA? If not, do you think this might have contributed to findings? Um, and I think that- That's a really interesting question. I think, and I will afterwards go back and check, but I think the SDQ, because it's a cumbersome 
um, question was was self complete. So there there were bits of the interview that the young person or the um, parent can completed as a, as a self-complete and they were either very sensitive topics that you might not want to say out loud like you know drug and alcohol exposure or they were the questionnaires that didn't really quite um, work as an interview but I'm not entirely sure what I can say is for the Dorba and the SEQ as part of it they did a head-to-head -head with telephone administration and um face-to-face -face administration. Um, I'm not sure anyone's done self-completion in this, and they showed that there was no difference, essentially, in the kinds of responses you get. Where I've seen the Dorba not work terribly well because it's a lovely combination of highly structured questions that just relate to the diagnostic criteria for DSM, now DSM-5 and ICD-10, um, but if there is a problem area, the informant is asked a series of probes. So you've got the reliability of a structured interview backed up by the increased validity of a semi-structured interview that asks, you know, you can pick up when someone's completely misunderstood a question. You can um, balance disagreements between informants the way you would in a clinic rather than having to write rules. And you can also assign not otherwise specified diagnoses um which i think is really important and if you give the dauber as a paper questionnaire that was disastrous because nobody wrote anything and it was very long and daunting i would hope online with text boxes that expand i mean some people do write write you essays um that might actually be better than it going through an interviewer who's frantically typing notes and sort of you know, uploads it when they get back to the office, but it's a really good question. I'm not sure it would count for the increase though. I'm, mm. you know, that is quite an increase from one in nine. And in fact, the SDQ showed one in nine, whereas the Dorber diagnosis showed one in eight. So the SDQ was underestimating by a percentage point compared to the SDQ. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Tams. And that was really, that was really great. I am, um, and just directing, um, actually, I just want to put a plug for the person who asked that question, Stephanie Lewis. She's a new PhD who was co-supervised by myself and Andrea Denise, and she's in the UK. So maybe you guys, she's a child psychiatrist, actually. She's really great. Um, oh, at the Institute of Psychiatry? Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. Know, yeah. yeah, okay. So that's who asked the technical question. So I'll put a little plug for her. But um, um, and we have other questions, and we're sorry that we have to end. We're already over time, but thank you, everyone. This will be um, posted online. And I encourage people to look at some of the other videos, also to follow Tamsin on Twitter because she um also has a lot of other um, you know, a lot of other uh, you know links to resources and other all the activities that she's doing um and um and some of the questions are addressed in other things we posted so hopefully people can connect there thank you very much thanks tams and have a great day thank you bye-bye thank you bye.